very many things. So I don't want to dazzle you with a lot of uh, other things apart from where your mind is meandering to midweek. Uh, we're coming towards uh, the end of day two. And uh, we're going to have a very interesting conversation from a truly East African man who has served on the Capital Markets Authority in Kenya, Central Bank in Uganda. Today he's speaking in Rwanda. He's, uh, he founded uh, a microfinance bank, which was the first MFI that was privately owned uh, uh, in Kenya at the time, uh, called K-Rep. It's now called Cidian Bank. Um, today he is a board member at CIDR Pamiga and the chair of Pamiga Finance has conducted several trainings, countless in the microfinance space. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join on the stage. Please allow me welcome Mr. Kimanthi Mutua uh, to take us through the next session. Mr. Kimanthi, karibu sana. Thank you very much, Charles, uh, for your very kind introduction. Your Excellencies, all dignitaries, my fellow actors in the inclusive finance sector, all protocols observed, good afternoon to you all. <coughs> To our Rwandese brothers and sisters, I want to salute you for your welcome and for the way you have accommodated us as up to now. We have really enjoyed your beautiful city. Many of us in this continent admire very much what Rwanda has done and accomplished in a very, very short time. So, as we say in Swahili, Hongera sana. It is really an honor and a challenge for me to give this keynote address at the end of our conference. It is an honor because it really bestows a humongous responsibility and expectations on me. But it's also a challenge. A challenge because much, if not all, has been said and therefore it's quite a tall order. But as we all know, conferences are about diverse ideas and information. And all that has been said earlier is extremely valuable to which I want to add. So for this, I would firstly like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and to all the other organizations that I belong to, Maine, Pamiga, and all that, for proposing me. I secondly want also to acknowledge a lot of the previous speakers for having really laid the foundation of some of the aspects that I will be making in this presentation. Right from the beginning, from the broad uh, 
uh, opening remarks through the other two keynote uh, speakers, Renee and Esther, and particularly the three presenters of the surveys. I think it was uh, Verdant Capital, MFR, and the first one, I think, I'm not uh, uh, forgotten the name. Because their findings, I think, vindicate a lot of what I have to say, which comes from anecdote evidence from my observations. So to hear data collaborating that, I think gives me some good one. My key address aims at contributing to the topic that we have, which is the stakeholder guidance for inclusive finance sector resilience and achieving the UN's uh, social development goals in Africa with a dash, what is the future? My suggestion, therefore, is that the future is in capacity building. And that is the topic of my presentation, in which I will be making suggestions which are based on my observations and the challenges and reactions thereto, as well as the hidden opportunities that most actors, us actors, have really yet to take advantage of. I think we focused more on the institutions rather than taking advantage of the uh, opportunities. In making these suggestions, I recognize, of course, that Africa is a very, very large continent with very many countries which are at very different stages of inclusive finance. However, in my experience of having worked probably in most, but only a few of these countries, I know that there are broad issues that are applicable almost everywhere. So, I want to first really set the stage for the recommendations on what I think the future uh, ought to be. I think the shock from the COVID-19 health crisis is a wake-up call. I think it's a wake-up call because the progress that inclusive finance has made in the last decade or so is really under threat. It's under threat to achieve the social development goals. The call presents also an opportunity, an opportunity to modify approaches in inclusive finance, particularly in the wake of three things. One is the health crisis, which for me is really the minor part. The second one is the impact of climate change, which is a bigger threat. But thirdly, is this rising lack of employment opportunities for young people, which is spurred by the fast rising population in Africa. That is probably the biggest threat that we have to attaining the social development goals. I think one of our earlier speakers in the opening session stated that even before the COVID health crisis, Africa was yet to really meet uh, any of the objectives in the, in, the, in the SDGs. My submission is that the main reason for that is because of the population growth. The new entrance to the labor market, which is constricted and which cannot be absorbed in the MSEs, is much larger than the access to any facilities for those youth. 
So I believe that in addressing those issues, we must also look at the influx of the new young players into the inclusive finance market. These are some of the people that are really not touched. There is very many new young players that are coming into the inclusive finance uh, market. These are young entrants into the SME informal segment, which as we were told earlier, is the largest employer and income generating sector in Africa. I think it was mentioned like 75% of the, of the employable population. Traditional SME businesses as we know them are changing. They are changing and presenting new opportunities. The methods of access to these financial services is also changing. And I think we need to be looking at what is changing more than the problems we have in the financial institutions to deal with the crisis, because that is only what can give us growth. Enough testimony on the impact, challenges, and remedial actions that have been taken, has been given in the last two days. There's been a lot which has been spoken. There is no doubt that the health, COVID-19 health crisis has shocked both providers of inclusive financial services as well as the businesses that we support in varying degrees. Albeit at a slower pace, the impact of climate change, especially on agro-based businesses, is contributing immensely to the changing operating environment. The operating environment for MSCs is changing, and is changing because partly the climate change is forcing many of the operators from that uh, business. So the question of resilience is really not a question of just resilience of protecting the institutions from shocks. But I think it's resilience on how we can now find new ways to grow. And I will give some of these examples on this. I think one of the uh, speakers earlier mentioned that we shouldn't focus on building walls that was Rene, but we should build bridges. And if you look at a lot of the reaction that has been to the shock, it has been to build walls and not to build bridges to the opportunities that are there. So I argue it is time to revisit capacity building. Why do I say revisit capacity building in various initiatives. I say this because for inclusive finance to get where it is today, there was immense investment in capacity building 20 years ago, 25 years ago. The reasons that the fintechs, commercial banks, and other players are coming in is because capacity was built, effectiveness was demonstrated, credit worthiness was demonstrated and they came in on it. But a lot of these capacity building initiatives stopped and maybe rightly so. They stopped, I think, because progress had been made. They stopped because institutions had become good in accessing financial services and reaching out to people. But the revisit is now necessary. 
very necessary to consider the valuable lessons that came during the COVID-19 health crisis, the impact of climate change, and the rising population. So I want to relook at some of the lessons that speak to the opportunities and to the challenges. So, on the one hand, we saw that the micro and small enterprises in the formal sectors did and continue to demonstrate their resilience to the challenges posed by the changing operating environment. So, we had a lot of talk here that, you know, institutions were the ones which are resilient, they managed to, to, to overcome this, but they actually did so because their customers and clients are very resilient. And they did so by adapting to new, to the new norm in many ways. Despite having been severely hit by the health crisis, a significant number survived. This was born through, I think, by some of the surveys that I had. A good number survived. Yes, there were a lot of initiatives to restructure the loans to do that, but a large percentage of those institutions, of those businesses, survived. There were very, very few that perished, as observed by the many MFIs who recorded a relative quick turnaround. So, the other lesson I think we have seen is the influx of youth-run innovative technology-based businesses. Okay. These include, but are not limited, to online entertainment businesses through the social medias, development of computer applications and smartphones, and other online services. They are there, subtle and coming up, but they are not visible to many of us providers. Additionally, the youth are revamping the operations of the traditional businesses. They're running them differently, either through the use of technology, restructure of the ownership, or even pulling together resources to do this and modifying the supply chains. This is being spurred by the shrinking employment opportunities for youth in Africa. And I think this is the biggest problem. And unless inclusive finance begins to look at that segment, then we can forget about those uh, social development goals. Because we will outreach, we will finance those ones, but that's the biggest segment that is coming. Continued climate change, and of course closures of business, as we've been told, and the emerging new businesses that are there. But my main concern is really this shrinking employment opportunities uh, from the youth, for youth. A colleague mentioned today that in some of the countries in West Africa where terrorism is really causing havoc, access to finance is actually in competition with the terrorists because they provide more funding to the youth than the youth can access to do any kind of a business. So when somebody is faced with the, that question of whether to run their business for which they can't get capital or access some cheap money and do some mischief, we know what they will get uh, into. So, I want 
going to go to the second lesson. So on the other hand, so on the one hand, we are looking at how resilient the MSEs are, how they are changing to the changing operating environment, and how actually they are moving ahead. But on the other hand, when we look at the service providers, to me, they appear to be less resilient and or slow to adapt to the changing operating environment. Again, emphasis focusing on really protecting what is they already have as opposed to looking outside. Despite the growth of new entrants into the sectors, the resilience and adaptability of SMEs, which has helped many providers survive, in fact, this is what helped them survive. Most players focused on restructuring and managing existing portfolios. They recorded very good recoveries, as demonstrated by NPLs that became good, and I think we had this also in one of the findings of the surveys, but they didn't take advantage of that to grow. So if we look at banks that provide services to SME sectors, they became more risk averse, which is a sad part because, to be honest, commercial banks had become much larger a provider of access to finance than the microfinance institutions. But they took a step back because they became risk averse even though they were really not severely affected by the health crisis, of course, largely due to their diverse portfolio, quick recovery, and, uh, and the large funding base that they have. They instead directed funding to larger institutions considered to, to be doing better during the crisis and shunned away uh, SMEs. Then when we look at uh, fintechs, which were almost not affected, simply because of their big margins, low cost of operations, and wide outreach, they had very quick recovery, and they can reach out uh, widely, but they too channeled lending to, uh, to, to, to MSCs and they focused on consumer credit. So much as we can praise a lot of the fintech for really increasing their access to finance, a lot of it is going to consumer, uh, 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 consumer credit. The MFIs, both deposit taking and non-deposit taking, experienced severe disruption to their operation, but for a very short time, six months, maximum eight months, they recovered. There were very few MFIs that went under, yeah? And those who did so were probably having problems before the pandemic. One interesting observation is that deposit-taking MFIs reported an increase in customer deposits, okay? So much as we're saying there was a crisis, they couldn't uh, do this, could do this, almost all deposit-taking MFIs reported an increase in customer deposits. Unfortunately, they were unable to grow their SME lending portfolio because of various reasons. MFIs that do not take deposits, many of them were engaged in lengthy negotiation to restructure their funding base 
and or access new facilities. I think we heard also from one of the presentation, the lack of capital in Africa, you know, and they observed that they was limited on that. Both deposit taking and non-deposit taking MFIs did experience a reduction in their funding base, obviously because the inflows from loan repayments were less and they couldn't have them much more. So there has been realization by many MFIs that the existing methodologies and systems have limitations and they are fast becoming extinct given the changing operating environment. As was observed by one MFI which said, we must change our model in which small scale credit for income generation activity is provided to groups of individuals based on social collateral group guarantees and whereas the individual lending is structured through cash flow models catering for the needs of this digital finance will help us to grow. So there's realization that the methodologies that exist have limitations. So what action then can we take? to go to actions for the time. I think for financial institutions, especially MFIs, they need to build capacity to identify, assess, and finance the emerging SMEs in the informal sectors, because that's one of the limiting factors. They are not growing because they have inability to really assess that risk that is there. They need to adapt existing methodologies to the changing operating environment and the needs of the new businesses. They need to introduce or accelerate implementation of digital finance solutions and make it the main interface method. I think this has been spoken again and again, but one of the challenges in this digital transformation, as we've heard people talk of the cost and talk of um, uh, other capacity also to implement, but I think we haven't looked at other solutions and what really constrains MFIs to really make the digital uh, transformation. Some of which can be gained through partnerships, others through even changing some of the existing stuff. Mobilization of deposits, especially for regulated MFIs, becomes a very, very important strategy because as we have seen, deposits even during crisis hardly go down. And therefore, if your funding base remain stable, then you can have ability to grow. And that dependence on borrowed funds is causing a lot of uh, challenges and problems. MFIs also need to build capacity to negotiate with funders to both vary the structure of their current borrowed funds, eliminate things like penalties, or secure new funding to cope with the crisis and also the emerging opportunities. It was interesting to hear from, I think it was Olivia of uh, uh, European Investment Bank to, that they are considering to have new instruments restructure this which would help MFIs to really address some of these issues. And I think this is one of the areas that needs to really come in. I think MFIs need to continue playing a pivotal role of generating demand through research, 
determining consumer, consumer needs and also proving the credit worthiness of SMEs. Retain staff on new approaches and systems because this is becomes retrain staff. I think retraining becomes one of the big things. And to really address this digital transformation, my suggestion is partnering with other institutions or also partnering with other providers of services like energy solutions, agriculture, and what have you, to be able to penetrate those new uh, markets that are coming. We've got MFI networks, because you know we have some here. They need to move away from the traditional work that they are doing. I think they need to focus on conducting analysis on how the changing environment and this crisis is really changing the business profile and identify the new emerging businesses and develop some knowledge sharing programs which can help institutions to start rethinking about how to do uh, uh, the future. Similarly, Suppliers of solution need to develop alternative technology-based methods, especially to the group guarantee and those cash flow-based lending models to cater for the needs of the emerging businesses. I think, I think this is where there can be a lot of, uh, a lot of dividend because the current model is basically copy the consumer-based applications to come and adapt them into SMEs as the methods for really accessing services. And those have limitations in reaching out to some of the emerging new uh, businesses. For SMEs, I come to find myself. Oh yeah, the suppliers. Yeah, the regulators, regulators, and policy makers. Because I think we have some of those also regulators who did quite a lot to try and help during the crisis. And of course, once the crisis goes down, they change those provisions. But I really they think they need to analyze the impact. The impact of the variations to the existing regulations that they made during the crisis and determine their impact. And if that impact is good, then think of ways of how you can make that uh, permanent. I think the crisis really presents an opportunity to regulators to now review the prudential guidelines to facilitate access to this new emerging MFIs. Because a lot of the regulations were created 10, 15 years after a lot of advocacy and getting regulators. There used to be a lot of capacity building for regulators. We would sit and call them, train them every day, and then they developed a lot of regulatory framework but I think it's time for them to review that. I think they need also to really introduce regulatory framework for digital finance service providers to protect MSE customers, because protection is something we haven't talked a lot about here. But one of the dangers of this uh, digital finance is really coming from things like uh, excessive charges, and over indebtedness that's coming. And there's lots of regulatory uh, initiative that is needed there. The funding partners. For me, I think the funding partners are the ones who can play the biggest role here because their support shapes a lot of what goes on with the suppliers. And if the funding partners continue to operate as they did before, it becomes difficult for even the MFIs to build their capacity. 
And capacity building is not just capacity of how to do things, but it is even capacity of your funding base and how that funding base can really grow. So I think they need to redesign the structure of their loan products to MFIs and consider the crisis and other changing operating environments, relook at some of those uh, penalty clauses that work during normal times because a lot of MFIs, for example, this clause that triggers default was applied during the COVID time, you know, and recalling the monies on that. They need to relook at that, see what flexibility can be brought into that. Introd introduce and enhance loan guarantees to facilitate MFIs to outreach to the emerging innovative businesses by the UN. I heard the European Investment Bank saying they want to do that. So this would be good, but all the funders is a challenge that we say you need to relook at this. I think business as usual should not continue even if the COVID crisis ends because the other two, the population and the climate is going to have a much bigger. So this opportunity we must take into that. They need to work with financial institutions to develop solutions to support SMEs which existence and continuity is threatened by the climate change. Communities like the fishing communities, the pastoral communities and all that. And they are, they are coming out with innovations but we have not able to reach that. They need also to support partnerships among all actors and especially those with alternative energy solutions because this can help very much curb the climate threat and promote those related businesses. There is a lot of initiatives now, for example, for alternative energy solutions, but those are working in isolation and they need to have some partnerships together with the uh, MFIs. SMEs will continue to adapt to the changing environment because they have no alternative but to survive and to being innovative. But they need protection. They need protection a lot, especially from some of the digital uh, financial services uh, provider. And this can be provided through consumer education and protection, which is something has been talked about for very many years but hasn't really been implemented. So in countries like where I come from, where digital finance has really gone very far ahead, there's a lot of threat coming on from that, a very, very significant threat. So in conclusion, really, I think we need a concerted collaborative effort involving all actors. It is very, very crucial to build the capacity for financial intermediary so that they can really effectively support the SMEs in this changing environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Kiman Thimutua. Very insightful. I'll request that you get another round of applause and kindly take your seat uh, down there. Thank you. Uh, Kel Sages, very, very rich words. As we, we are going to the last session, um, it will be led by a lady who doesn't need a lot of introduction, if any at all. Uh, she's the executive director of ADA, and uh, she'll introduce her panel. Just for any, everyone's information, the, the panel that is coming upstairs will also be discussing some of the issues that were raised by, by Mr. Kimanthi. Uh, Madam Laura Foshi, over to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay, that's better. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to see you again. Um, maybe I can ask the two speakers, Bram and Tudi, to join me, 
The idea is of this session is to look ahead from different perspectives and practical as one as well in order to be better prepared for the future, to share ideas. I know that during this two-day conference you have already shared and presented a lot of insights, a lot of uh, strategies, a lot of uh, challenges as well, and problems and questions that are not yet being answered. And uh, yes, with this last session we don't want to, to do a wrap-up because uh, it's it would be too hard. We just want to present some um, yeah, solutions maybe, some uh, insights from uh, three different perspectives, as I said. Um, so to do that maybe uh, is I want to introduce uh, the first speaker, that is uh, Mr. Lombardo. Uh, Paolo Lombardo is the representative of the European Investment Bank. Sorry. Um, that is uh, uh, head of the EIB's regional representation for East Africa, is based in Nairobi. Uh, prior to, move, um, to moving to Kenya, Mr. Lombardo was the Deputy Director General of the EIB's uh, Risk Management Directorate. And he has uh, almost 20 years of experience of career at the EIB. Uh, please, uh, Paolo, you can join us. Hear me? Yes. All right. Dear Excellencies, uh, dear audience, as the new representative of the EIB in East Africa, let me say I'm delighted to be here with you in person today, and I want to emphasize in person. I was discussing earlier with one of the panelists that this is the first time in two years that I actually find myself in front of physical people and not just uh, LCD screens. Let me start by warmly thanking and congratulating the organizers, Ada, and in particular Laura and her team for organizing this event under the challenging conditions of the COVID pandemic. Really well done for having brought us all together under one roof again. Now, I'm pleased and honored to share with you today insights on the future developments of the financial inclusion sector. My predecessor, my, the previous speaker already alluded to some key messages that came out of uh, uh, Olivier, my colleague in headquarters. I will pick up some of those uh, themes today. Now, let me give you a little bit of background on EIB. We have been a long-standing investor in microfinance. Our first microfinance loan was actually in 1990 in the Dominican Republic. Our first engagement in microfinance in Africa goes back to year 2000 with a loan to a microfinance institutions in Benin. This turned out to be the first of a long series of investments that EIB is, has concluded on the African continent. Today we have provided 370 million euros of direct loans to MFIs and on top of that an additional 230 million euros of equity investments in microfinance funds for a total of 600 million euros. Clearly, the idea has not acted alone. We work with a number of stakeholders and other investors, such as microfinance investment vehicles, other DFIs, consultants, think tanks like ADA, and many of them are present here today. Now, let us reflect critically on our accomplishments. I think uh, the previous speakers alluded to it's no longer time for business as usual. On the uh, areas that we need to do better and on the future challenges and needs of the sector. First, today microfinance institutions are very, very different from the ones we financed 20, 30 years ago. Over time, microfinance institutions have increasingly been subject to external regulations and have developed internally stronger governance and risk management structures. This institutionalization made microfinance institutions more stable, financially more robust and resilient. And I'm pleased to see the NPL figures shown earlier, uh, meaning that 
work, good work has been done to date. However, the financial inclusion agenda is still a work in progress. Microfinance institutions' risk-taking capacity continues to prevent many of them to increase their outreach. Some still tend to focus on existing clients and tested products. We need to move on. According to the latest FINDEX report, 43% of the adult population of Sub-Saharan Africa held a bank account in 2017, up from only 23% in 2011. One can rejoice at the considerable progress made in just a few years. However, financial exclusion still persists as more than half of the African population remain unbanked. Going forward, our joint commitment towards the microfinance sector must be, further, must be to further deepen the reach of the MFIs. And to fill this exclusion gap, we both as investors and MFIs must adapt. First and foremost, we need to insist on the fact that our investments benefit the most vulnerable entrepreneurs, women, youth, poor farmers, and rural populations. But for this to happen, we as investors must improve our product offering. Again, the previous speaker alluded to that. To encourage the microfinance institutions to reaching out to the most vulnerable. Again, business as usual is over. For example, we will need dedicated credit lines tailored for the needs of the financially excluded. As an example, the IB, alongside other DFIs, has promoted a gender-focused initiative called 2X Challenge. This initiative was launched in 2018 as a major new commitment of the DFIs to invest in women in emerging markets, supporting them in unique challenges they face. The IB now regularly uh, includes in many of its loan operations gender targets and criteria to incentivize our partners to reach women entrepreneurs. And in the future, we will have far more focus on youth. Again, the previous speaker alluded to, to this drama of many, many young people finding difficulty in finding jobs. So we will focus in particular on youth uh, young entrepreneurs, another vulnerable group which is underserved, often because they are perceived as being too risky due to the lack of experience and collateral. To serve these groups effectively, we will need a more targeted strategy and products. We expect to see pricing for results loan facilities, whereby a price incentives would benefit MFIs in case they reach specific impact targets but evidently pricing for impact loan facilities will not be enough to help microfinancial institutions reach the poorest entrepreneurs. Additional solutions will be needed by investors for clients, which are or might be perceived as too risky. One of these solutions from the investor side is portfolio guarantees in favor of MFIs. With such products, MFIs will have part of the risk associated with their loans covered by third parties. With the provision of portfolio guarantees, MFIs would have an incentive to develop new products and reach new clients without taking on excessive additional risks. This would be a transitory product, meaning that it would be needed only until the MFIs are able to serve these new clients in a sustainable and profitable manner on their own, that is without need of external support. And I can tell you that we as EIB have been the beneficiaries of portfolio guarantees from the European Union, and that has actually helped us reach out new clients and develop new products. And following this initial transition, now we are able to continue on that path with less financial support. The same could apply to MFIs. Now let's look at MFI's product offering. Thanks to the fast evolution of the microfinance ecosystem, microentrepreneurs can now access a large palette of products. However, one key financial service still needs to be further strengthened, the microinsurance product. Health and life and death insurance may not be a priority for microfinance institutions yet. 
but this should change in the future, as these services would very well complete the microfinance offer. Insurance product could mitigate the impact of life events that impair people. Availability of insurance for the most vulnerable will also reduce the credit risk of the MFIs. All these new financial solutions will help the, the sector reaching out the more vulnerable clients. However, they will not be sufficient to tackle the new systemic risk they're exposed to, in primis, climate change. Climate change is expected to affect the majority of micro uh, entrepreneurs active in Africa and make their livelihood even more precarious. Vulnerable, vulnerable groups would be particularly exposed to the consequences of climate change. Female farmers are even more at risk as they tend to operate at smaller parcels of land and have less access to financial and productive resources. For all these reasons, insurance for climate-related risk could play a major role in protecting vulnerable farmers and MFIs from unexpected financial losses. Not only this will reduce the risk people are exposed to, but insurance product will also facilitate lending to smallholder farmers. This being said, we should not un uh, underestimate the complexity to develop microinsurance. This will require a joint commitment from the entire microfinance community. Risk hedging solutions for climate change, however, are only part of the solution. They will be accompanied by technical assistance. Why? Because climate change is here to stay. It will become, and in some cases, it already is the new normal. So both MFIs and their clients will need capacity building, again, a theme that was stressed by the previous speaker, to adapt to such new normal. MFIs will require expert support to develop new products and processes, in particular in terms of risk management. But so will their clients. Think about climate change once again. Microinsurance will help avoiding major one-off losses. But the full long-term resilience will only be achieved if on top of insurance we will help farmers adopt best farming practices and adapt to the effects of climate change in a structural way. I cannot conclude without underlying one key precondition to achieve our common objectives. By supporting financial inclusion, all of us are aiming at providing micro-entrepreneurs and their household a better life. However, we should bear in mind that people who are financially excluded often lack the capacity to make the right financial choices. Therefore, we must protect them also against themselves, notably to avoid over-indebtedness. Increasing the outreach of microfinance services, therefore, must be achieved with quality products that serve clients' needs and are not detrimental. I think the reference to the, the, the risk associated with digital instruments is particularly uh, important as crime, uh, digital crime is particularly worrisome going forward. To conclude, the microfinance industry has grown tremendously over the past decade and we should all be proud of this achievement. The years ahead, however, require an even stronger commitment and engagement by investors and MFIs, as we will all be exposed to new challenges, threatening once again the lives of Africa's poor. First and foremost, we do need to deepen the sector's social mission to ensure we achieve our financial inclusion goals. And for that to happen, we investors and MFIs will need to develop smart and innovative solutions. Fortunately for us, relative to 20 years ago, we will not only face new hurdles going forward. Two key enablers will support and facilitate this journey. The first is technology and digitalization. The second is stronger regulation. A lot has been said about these two enablers in previous sessions, so I will not repeat it. All I will say is that these two very powerful tools render me optimistic about the ability of the, finance, the microfinance industry to address challenges ahead, adapt, and improve further. So let's take on this challenge together with the same passion and energy with which the microfinance industry was established decades ago. Thank you very much. Th 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lombardo. You raised very interesting points. And now we would like to explore them uh, with our two speakers. Um, let me introduce so, uh, Mr. Van de Bosch. Uh, he is uh, the CEO uh, and the co-founder of, uh, yesterday we, we were not sure to call it MFI, Agritech, FinTech, and so we decided MFI Tech. Then, then we will see if it works. Uh, so Bram uh, has a long experience in investment banking and asset manage management in different banks, uh, mainstream banks, um, in the Netherlands, in Russia, Switzerland, uh, and particularly uh, to finance uh, agriculture in emerging markets. Uh, Bram is also uh, the founder, if I'm not wrong, uh, of uh, a technology company, Laboremos, uh, which creates financial technology. So when we talk about innovation, digital, you are the person to address all our questions. And uh, let me introduce also Mr. Tudi Muyelo. Uh, Tudi is the Chief Investment Officer of the Rwanda Finance Limited. Um, he has a solid international banking and finance experience, I would say all over the world, because he worked in Europe, and particularly in Luxembourg, in Asia, uh, and Singapore, and, and also in Africa over the last 20 years. Um, the Rwanda Finance Limited has the ambition to create an international hub for finance in Africa, so uh, we will uh, ask you some questions on how to address the new challenges and how uh, this can be helpful for the country, of course, Rwanda, but also for the region and the continent as well. So let me start with um, some insight that comes from the uh, Kimanti Mutua closing speech and uh, Mr. Lombardo as well, about the importance of uh, the collaboration among the different actors of inclusive finance, actors that are new in some cases, old in other. Um, and I absolutely agree that the, the different stakeholders have to be involved in order to uh, coordinate, to have the best coordination, if we want really uh, to leave uh, nobody behind. Um, so, first question to Bram. What does it mean for your organization, collaboration, and which kind of challenges you face uh, to uh, really reach uh, the good partners and to talk with the stakeholders? It's a spoiler alert, many challenges. But indeed, collaboration is, is key to, to achieve impact at scale, and I guess that, that's what we're all striving for. Um, speaking from my own experience, there have been uh, a fair amount of challenges, but thankfully also bright spots. So let me just talk to, to a couple of those. Um, I, I'm not sure if there are any technology startups uh, among the audience, um, but if they are, uh, they, they know what I'm talking about when I'm saying that the first few years as a technology startup, um, they, they may look very exciting, but they are incredibly tough. Um, in the forward-leaning parts of the world, governments do what they can to support these startups, especially in the, in the early years. Um, but I can say the country where we were incorporated, um, it was rather the opposite. High taxes, high cost of doing business. <sighs> right, there's a reason why in, in many parts of Africa, uh, in the first two years of existence, 50% of the companies don't make it. Um, there are a few bright spots, and I believe that Rwanda is one of the um, countries showing, hopefully the rest of Africa, how it should be done by stimulating uh, young technology companies, in particular in the first early years, right, tax breaks, subsidies, etc. Um, the, the other challenge I would say is, is utilities. Now, obviously, when, you, when I say utilities, right, people probably think about, you know, power cuts, and, unreliable internet, all, all true. But for any innovative MFI, I would say the key utility actually is the mobile money network. 
Uh, mobile money is such an enabler of innovation, uh, but it requires you to deal with the telcos. I hope there are exceptions, but I haven't personally found them. It is a tremendous challenge to deal with the telcos. Um, as I promised, I would also mention a few bright spots. Um, actually, the, the regulators at least uh, were, were, were active in Uganda. I thought our regulator was surprisingly um, supportive. They had a very good tiered structure. Um, so some people have been lobbying very well because the regulators are certainly doing their job, job well. And I would say the biggest positive is, is what in the tech world we always call the, the tech ecosystem, right? The, uh, the access to talent, the access to support, um, you know, other ventures that are a bit further ahead that, that you know, they tend to give you, you know, advice for free, make introductions for you. Um, that has been growing very fast across Africa. Uh, I think in countries like, you know, Kenya, Nigeria, it's, it's big and, and very supportive. Uh, as I mentioned, we're from Uganda, where, where things are still small, um, but the, the culture is very supportive. Um, so that's, that, that's great. Um, so, so I would say, slowly but surely, the mentality to collaborate is, is coming there. Um, you know, the ecosystem is good, the regulators are, are supportive. Um, but I would say particularly government and telcos um, that they should pull, uh, pull a bit more weight. Thank you, Bran. I was curious because uh, before we said uh, MFI tech, agri tech, how do your classical stakeholders see you? And if you can tell to the audience in just a few words what Emata is. Yeah, so we, we, we finance farmers um, in a fully digital way. Um, and I would say for farmers, we are the difference between the loan sharks, right, the, the informal money lenders in, in fancy jargon, uh, and, and a formal loan, right, with, with a proper financial institution. So I, I believe they see us as a very sort of, you know, proper financial institution, uh, and often we, we are the first formal loan that they're getting, uh, and thankfully uh, I'm quite proud that, that our pricing of our loans is, is accordingly as opposed to uh, what, what the loan sharks are doing. Okay, thanks. Um, Tudi, so how uh, the Rwanda Financial Limited can contribute to reinforce this coordination? Um, thank you, Laura, for the question. Um, first of all, I'm mindful of time for the audience. It's quite late. Um, I really uh, appreciate to be here today. Uh, how long do I have to answer? Yes, uh, not today, <laughs> <laughs> just one minute. <laughs> okay. We'll come back on another. Okay. Yeah. So, um, first of all, allow me to correct uh, what you just said before. Um, Rwanda Finance Limited uh, is the agency in charge of the promotion and development of a new initiative called Kigali International Financial Center. This initiative is actually already alive. Mm -hmm. So, we have very high expectation and objectives, but as of today, we are already ranked the first financial center in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so what I will be speaking about uh, are not things that we are just envisaging, but that are actually happening today okay. in, in Rwanda. In terms of collaboration, um, we have to understand that usually the solution already exists somewhere. Uh, we have not created anything new here in Rwanda to become the first financial center in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, what we have done uh, is to partner. Partner with other leading financial centers. Mm -hmm. And to talk to the public, um, we have signed recently two partnerships that we believe could be of interest uh, for the audience. Uh, the first one, it, as it was mentioned yesterday by the Minister of Finance of Rwanda and the Minister of Financial um, Cooperation, sorry, of Luxembourg. Um, we have signed a partnership between Luxembourg and Rwanda. What is this partnership saying and what does it mean for, for us here today in this room? This partnership will be 
giving to Rwanda the support to build professional training for microfinance and financial institutions. We want and we will become the center of reference for training into microfinance activities, especially in the field of good governance and innovation for new products. So the way we look at um, cooperation, collaboration, is how to take the best from other parties. And here the invite that we are giving is come to Rwanda and take full advantage of what is being developed. Same wise, talking about uh, cooperation, we are now also attracting investors in the country. So I cannot disclose the details, but for example, we have one of the local MFIs benefiting from the establishment of a new investment fund that is coming in the country. Uh, so what, again, we want to see is more people on the continent to come to Rwanda and to benefit from the proximity that we are building between investors and investment opportunity. Thank you very much. I, I suppose that we can talk for one week only for about this topic, but it's very interesting because we, uh, you address uh, some questions that have been raised before about capacity building, uh, um, particularly Kimanti Mutua uh, was talking about this, and this is one solution that you are uh, providing for, for, for your country and not only for that. Um, another topic uh, that has been raised uh, in different sessions, uh, if we can say in all, but uh, mo mo most, um, is how uh, reaching the most vulnerable people. Um, we were talking about young people. Um, uh, Kimanti uh, said that we have to modify our approach. And Mr. Lombardo talked also about different way to act. Uh, we cannot uh, continue business, business as usual. Uh, so we have to look at different profiles and so on. So, um, Emata, what is doing to reach these um, vulnerable people, and particularly women, uh, young people, and the ones that are living in the rural remote areas that I think are your target? Yes, yes, exactly. We, we focus exclusively on, on, on farmers, um, obviously, in, including women, but, but I think, sadly, uh, even though the entire world uh, is and will need African farmers, uh, even more so in a few decades to come, given where, where we are going in terms of our, our globalization, uh, sorry, the, the global population growth. Um, but indeed, um, as I mentioned uh, uh, when you asked me previously, very often we, we are the first formal loan that, that these farmers are getting. Um, they seem to be um, extremely underserved. Um, women, men, young, old, it almost doesn't matter. Um, and, and indeed, right, uh, I hope that uh, others will follow example. Uh, because I, I, I like to believe that we, we have proven that this, this segment can be served and, and can be served profitably. And in fact, when, when I just started um, looking into starting this company, I, I was quite shocked that so few people were actively trying to innovate uh, how to reach these farmers. Because agriculture in Africa is absolutely massive. There's rarely a place in the world where agriculture contributes 20 to 30 percent of the economy. Um, the need for financing is just endless, right? The reports say that in sub-Saharan Africa alone, farmers need 240 billion dollars, right? So if you get this right, the demand is almost almost endless. Um, but obviously, you need to get this right, um, and and that's yeah, that's that's the tricky part. 
Um, farmers, there are many of them, but they often want fairly small loans, um, which makes it, the way at least I look at it, sort of a, a high volume, low value model, um, which you can only serve if you use technology. Now, thankfully, technology is there, data science is there, um, and if you use them well, this, this can be done, but I can understand that for many people that is a big challenge, maybe even a bit scary to really start relying upon technology as opposed to the old ways of doing business in terms of you know sitting in your credit committee, discussing each file separately, um, but I, I don't think there's a different way, and, and Mr. Lombardo also point, pointed it out, right? Yeah, you, you have to use technology um, to reach these vulnerable groups um, effectively and efficiently at, at scale. Okay, so digital is a way to include in the financial sector for, with the first... It's a must. The first, the, I, I don't the first think there's one. any other way. Uh, but it is also tricky. It has been mentioned in several uh, sessions, uh, the fact that... Uh, innovative and digital lending can also uh, cause harm to the clients. Uh, how do you do? Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Uh, loans, loans can be incredibly powerful, uh, but definitely loans are also a, a double-edged sword, right? They can do almost as much damage as they can do good. Um, the, the way I look at it, two things are, are key. Right? How are the loans used? So what's the purpose? And obviously, what is the rate, right? So how much does it cost? Now, the purpose is tricky, right? You can insist that loans should be used for productive use only, um, but then you're not, just not doing justice um, to the reality that most borrowers face, right? There simply are emergencies that people tend to cover with loans because there's no other way, um, right? People often struggle with school fees, right? They need to be paid, and yeah. Um, often it's loans. So that one is a bit tricky. Uh, we have our own view on it, but I, I can't give sort of a very black and white answer. Uh, when it comes to interest rates, it's super straightforward. Above a certain rate, loans are harmful, um, right? If the loan is more expensive than the, than the return you make on the investment you do with the loan, yeah, right, it's, it's, it's very dangerous. Um, so you need to keep your rates low. Um, and in order to keep your rates low, you need to be very efficient and you need to operate, sort of automate all your processes to the extent possible. Um, and that's sort of the main philosophy that we had behind Imata, right? We, we can do this, but we can only do this if we automate the whole shebang. So, and that's what we do. We automate data collection, we automate our alternative credit scoring, and we automate our, our loan disbursements. Um, that means that you need to innovate um, qu quite a bit. Uh, and, and from where I'm sitting, and also in my previous jobs, right, I, I see MFIs doing a good job on designing new loan products, maybe even digitizing their distribution model, but they tend to start falling short on how do we actually op automate our internal credit decision process. That, that's what they find, um, yeah. find really scary. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we have automated everything, um, but I am pretty sure that people in this audience uh, probably work in uh, rural African settings. Um, and of course, automation implies digitization, and, and many people here probably know that digitization you know, in rural areas is, is, is very difficult, right? It, it doesn't work, uh, which we certainly have learned. Um, so sort of our last mile digitization strategy is, is slightly different uh, and maybe interesting um, for others and maybe other people are doing something similar. Um, so we don't digitize farmers individually. In fact, we don't even approach farmers individually because right, they don't have smartphones and uh, I guess that's the starting point or they don't have smartphones yet is, is I guess the proper way of saying it. So we, we work with partners and we digitize them. So we work with cooperatives, aggregators, uh, large buyers of agricultural commodities, um, and we use them as a sort of last mile digitization tool mm -hmm. um, to do those things that we can't do directly with the farmer yet because simply, right, um, the market isn't quite ready yet. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I think that design in a client-centric way be uh, attentive of what the client is able to repay and how adapted is the product that you are providing them and in, for your specific business model to uh, yeah to collaborate with the, the cooperatives and uh, the uh, producers organization can be a way to avoid some uh, harmful uh, results that are unexpected and yeah that I can mean be happen. yeah w w when it comes to that indeed um, the way I at least I see it right you need to use digitization to lower your costs and not to just push blindly credit you know um, to people that that may not be able to handle it properly um, yeah because otherwise indeed digitization will just get people into problems uh, and you're not part of the solution Thank you. I don't know, to the, uh, we, we are very short in time, unfortunately. Do you mind if I open a question, a raise question to, to the audience for, in, for you? We are all here to serve, you know? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> in case we don't have questions, I have questions. So, so we can uh, open the floor to the audience for questions, if there are. Yes, there is one. There is nobody with the microphone? Yes. Um, my question goes to Brian. I'm Didier yeah. Njumesi, GIZ, German Corporation on Agricultural Finance Project. So I'm pretty interested in what you've just said. I really want you to explain a bit more how you, you say you don't digitalize individuals, but cooperative aggregators. Can you give us a bit more insight on that? Because that's, that's new to me and seems to be very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, uh, with maybe, pleasure. Maybe we take another one. Maybe we take another one. Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. There is another one? We take two and then we answer. Okay, I'm, I'm called Godfrey. Um, you, you said in Uganda the regulator is quite awake, and it's true. Um, we have a very well structured uh, tier system, I mean, for, for financial institutions, from tier one naturally to tier four, and uh, with the well established regulations, uh, actually acts of parliament that govern uh, these tiers at different levels. The le one of the latest being one that governs the microfinance institutions and the money lenders in the country. But then the question I've been <laughs> asking is whether um, the regulator is not going to extremes. And I wanted to find out particularly uh, how uh, one of the latest uh, regulations, particularly the, the, the tier four microfinance and the money lenders act would affect, for example, you know, these the small initiatives that are, are started, for example, by women, uh, I mean, uh, rural farmers and so forth, to provide finance, who uh, actually also provide opportunity uh, for the, uh, the, the, the financial service providers who are inside here. For example, to work with them, they are called self-help groups uh, within uh, the frame of that law. Uh, and then there are also circles, for example, if you go to that act, you will find circles, you will find all those. So the regulator has put in place some mechanism, uh, which of course can be said to be positive. Uh, for example, ensuring the safety, you know, of monies that are put there by, uh, by the members. And there's reduced some, for example, uh, prudential arrangements quite akin to what you would see uh, in the Financial Institutions Act that govern, you know, uh, the mainstream, uh, I mean, the financial uh, uh, sector. So what I'm asking really is, uh, what would be the effect of this kind of regulations on very small scale, you know, microfinance, uh, you know, that are initiatives that are established by the rural poor, and how does this, 
affect the relationship between established microfinance institutions and these small uh, self-help groups or circles and so forth, like in the case of Uganda, for example. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Both are for Brown. Yeah. I'm sure uh, <laughs> my colleague here also has a perspective well, on the second. Of um, let me at least answer, answer the first one from, from you. Um, so, there are a couple of things you need to do if you want to lend to, to groups or individuals, I should say, digitally, right? You obviously need a data trail on that person so you can distinguish the good, right, from, from, from the bad. Um, you need to do your, you know, your customer requirements, right, which require a picture, maybe scanning of an identity document. Um, and obviously, you want the person to be able um, to ask for a loan digitally to keep costs low. Um, but you want to offer them a process that is actually conducive to taking a proper credit decision, right, a as a borrower. Um, these things are all possible. But in my experience, they require a smartphone. Um, and that is not something that you can, can bank upon uh, in, in rural areas yet. Um, and that's why we came up with a partnership model and have our partners do those things on our behalf uh, because we help them out with a big problem themselves, right? Because if you're a cooperative and you don't finance your farmers, your farmers will slowly but surely go somewhere else. So we use our partners to get the data trail that we need, right, for, to feed our alternative credit scoring engines. Um, and for those farmers that don't have a smartphone, right, they will take the picture of the farmer, that they will scan the ID document, uh, and they will help those farmers that, that don't have a smartphone to originate a loan. Um, so these, those key things that, right, uh, aren't quite possible yet in practice, right, because in theory, of course, they're possible. Um, that's, that's, that's where we work with, work with our partners. Um, I will not answer your question in full because I know my colleague has a way more interesting perspective on it. Um, the only thing I would say is, um, I just think it's incredibly good that in this case, the Ugandan government or the Ugandan regulator, I should say, um, introduced such a light license because I guess as you know, tier one, two, three, they recently, or they have proposed to increase the minimum capital requirements to levels that are really, you know, stifling initiatives. And I think it's better to regulate lightly than not to regulate at all, because these things are happening, whether the regulator likes it or not. So they better just, right, regulate the smallest ones lightly and keep track of them and, and do what they can uh, to prevent harm. Because if you make it impossible to, or too expensive to be regulated, yeah, it will just happen in the black market and then the regulator has lost all the influence that they have. Do you want to answer the question about regulator? Yes, I can say a few words about regulation. Um, first of all, um, I cannot pretend uh, knowing the regulation in Uganda, uh, but there are a few things that we are doing here uh, that are important, um, we believe, um, not only for Rwanda, but for Uganda and the other countries in the region. You know, when you look at um, what we are doing, we cannot be playing in silo. So when we think about um, MFIs, and they need as well to expand, uh, what we are leading towards, we believe, is in the future to have more harmonized regulation. What we want to see in the future is an MFI from Uganda being able to easily open its operation in Rwanda. What we want to see is an MFI in Rwanda being able to maybe assist a sister or brother company in Congo in providing loans to their respective clients. Mm -hmm. uh, in that respect, um, we have, again, talking about collaboration, um, we have signed with, uh, with Singapore something that we believe is quite innovative. Um, maybe a question to you and to other associations that are putting together all those MFIs. Um, how can we build trust amongst ourselves? Um, and that trust will have the objective to exchange information and to be able to benefit 
from resources that the trustee party may have and that we don't have. So to be very concrete, um, we have built what we called a financial trust corridor mm -hmm. with Singapore, where banks in Singapore and banks, or let's say FIs in Singapore and FIs in Rwanda are now able to exchange data on their clients with the possibility for one bank to actually support the financing need of the other bank. That's the end goal. So now looking at MFIs, I'm sure that some of you in the room have actually enough resources. You just want to have more clients. You have your existing market, but you'd be very happy to have access to clients that are coming from other markets. How to make it happen? What are we waiting to start to really discuss about real business? That should be my call today. Mm -hmm. I can keep you <laughs> for, for a question that I wanted to ask you before, and it, it, that is related to Mr. Lombardo's speech. Uh, it is about the risking. Uh, he talked about guarantees, the fact that we have to change, uh, yes, the way in which maybe we have to analyze the risk assess the risk and all uh, other ways in which we can risk uh, the, the, the product that we are going to provide. Um, what this, the, the Rural Finance Limited and, and the Centre then uh, is supposed to be or what are your insights about the, the risking uh, portfolio of the microfinance institutions? Uh, thank you for the question. I will refer, if you don't mind, uh, to what have been my previous life. Okay? Uh, I'm still young and uh, I still have a life before being younger again. Um, what is risk? We like to use terms that sometimes we don't actually understand. And what is the risk for MFI? What is the risk for a bank? The risk, end of the day, is not to reach or not to obtain something that was expected, right? So in the case of an MFI, the risk is maybe not to receive the payment back from a loan. And when we talk about the risking or the perception of risk of those MFI clients, we need to go back to the, to the roots of it. Why will an MFI client be more risky than a bank client. We do believe that this is mainly coming first from information. When you know with whom you are dealing with, that perception of risk is reduced, right? So I don't want to go into the discussion of guarantees, which is a very valid topic, very important, but we as players in the MFI sector, we should be helping our clients for them to be more transparent, for them to be able to present, express themselves in the way that we understand. Because end of the day, this whole game is between two parties. You know, I was talking to some of my colleagues about why don't we allow foreign companies to open accounts in Rwanda? The answer was, yeah, but we don't know them. They are not in Rwanda. Then I said, okay, so if the same people are actually opening a company in Rwanda and they open a bank account, are you okay? The answer is yes, because we know them. So talking about risk, once again, I believe, we believe it is a matter of transparency, a matter of information, and of course, a matter of talking the same language, this education awareness on how someone should be known in order to receive what is entitled to receive. And also how someone can be known in order to be protected by those that are providing the services. So now if you talk about products, yes, as a MFI, what do you know about your client? What do you know when they are facing an issue? If you know that, then you will be able to develop the right product to support them in case of challenges, climate, you, you can call it as you want. But from what I see today, we are still in the very 
basic approach of they are risky, we need to have guarantees, we need, no, what we need is you need to know who we are dealing with. Um, I will end with a very simple quote that I think can summarize everything. Um, the quote is, uh, I am because you are, right? So I can only be if I understand that I'm not alone. MFIs, they are not alone, and they are only because of their clients. To our speakers, to Mr. Lombardo too, and to Bram and Tutti. Um, as I call upon uh, the president of Maine as a microfinance institution network to kindly give us his uh, closing remarks and close for us the conference, I will request everybody to stay in the room. We have some very, very important announcements to make. Uh, kindly stay in the room even after Mr. Yombo Odanu has finished speaking. I'll now call upon uh, Mr. Yombo Odanu to kindly give us, uh, to close for us this conference. He's a strong historical partner of ADA, and he, he's probably amongst the few in the room who have attended all uh, SAMs. Over to you, sir. Bien, merci l'excellent animateur. Mesdames, Messieurs, nous pouvons aujourd'hui dire enfin. Enfin parce que ce rêve est une réalité. Parce que qui l'eût cru, avec cette pandémie, qui sévit encore et qui fait peur. À cet effet, je voudrais profiter de cette opportunité pour exprimer ma joie et ma satisfaction à la réussite de ces trois jours d'événements variés. D'événements variés, quand on vient d'écouter tout à l'heure les conclusions avant la clôture autour de l'aura, nous pouvons tirer la conclusion que les trois jours sont pleins de succès et que nous avons tiré profit de ces différentes conférences animées à travers des consultants compétents, des modérateurs, des orateurs qui ont laissé leur savoir-faire. Alors, permettez-moi, au nom du réseau MEN, et d'Afraka, et au nom à vous tous et toutes, pour dire un grand merci. Un grand merci au gouvernement du Rwanda qui a favorisé et qui a mis en place un cadre favorable et qui a permis à l'aboutissement de ces événements. Aussi un grand merci au gouvernement du Luxembourg, dont le ministre a fait le déplacement personnel pour venir inaugurer et assister à ces conférences. Un grand merci, chers amis, je vous prie quand même d'applaudir pour dire aux deux gouvernements que merci pour tout. Alors, ces événements ne seraient été possibles que si on n'avait pas des partenaires sûrs qui ont accompagné ADA à l'organisation de cette édition de la Semaine africaine de la microfinance ici à Kigali. 
Il s'agit bien entendu d'un partenaire clé qui est la Fondation Mastercard. Merci à la Fondation Mastercard. Au côté, nous avons des prix d'excellence à travers des sponsoring. Nous avons le sponsor en argent qui revient à European Investment Bank. et à FPMI. Le sponsor, les sponsors en bronze, nous pouvons citer ADEC, ADEC, Access to Finance Rwanda, Arend, la Fondation Gramin Agricole, Microfact, et bien sûr notre grand ami africain de la CIDI. et qui est toujours à nos côtés. Je voudrais, enfin, avec votre permission, sans pour ce remerciement interpellé, le président d'Afraca, s'il est dans la salle, est-ce qu'il peut venir Le président d'Afraca, pour le point focal, qui est l'un des co-organisateurs, désolé, Afraca n'est pas là, je vous prie quand même de l'acclamer. Et le réseau, le grand réseau africain de la microfinance, MEN, que je représente. Et sans oublier son directeur exécutif, qui est le point focal, un expert toujours à, aux côtés d'ADA pour l'organisation des semaines africaines de la microfinance. Je veux nommer Atanda Mohamed. Ah, le collègue Afraka est, est là. Est, il est du Ghana. Merci beaucoup, Afraka. Donc, euh, enfin, je voudrais encore une fois dire merci à vous tous. Applaudissez pour vous-même, parce que vous avez été excellent. Kerman, l'animateur brillant, qui a su. Et sans oublier qui, sans eux, on n'aurait pas eu l'utilité de ces écouteurs. Je voudrais parler les traducteurs. Merci à vous, les traducteurs. Et je voudrais laisser la parole à Laura pour qu'il continue pour le reste des remerciements. Ah, plutôt Charles. Ok, je vous en prie. Merci beaucoup, Charles. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Yombo.